Welcome. Welcome to the Opperman Report. You can find us here every Friday night, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, and also simulcast on CJ Mars Radio and 365 Live, normally. Uh, tonight, uh, we are not. Uh, I think uh, CJ Mars Radio is down due to technical difficulties tonight. And uh, I'd like to ask you to, uh, uh, well, circumstances beyond our control, let's call it that. And I'd like you to, uh, to keep uh, Cindy Jean-Pierre and her husband in your prayers and their family in your prayers tonight. CJ Mars Radio, uh, Cindy Jean-Pierre, uh, they're going through some, you know, uh, uh, they need your prayers tonight, okay? And they need your support and your good thoughts and your well wishes. Uh, so we just pray that God blesses them tonight and, and God's with them and, uh, uh, throughout their troubles tonight. Uh, we're also uh, broadcast on uh, shoutcast.com. And then throughout the week... We have, we are, well, I'm doing my intro there. <laughs> okay, Jackie. Um, then we're rebroadcast throughout the week on uh, awakeradio.us and hazyradio.com and firehorseradio.com. Now, coming up in August, oh, by the way, tonight we got a great big guest coming up tonight. We have Jackie Hollander, and uh, she has some personal experiences. She's going to be telling us about the real story, about the real James Brown. She was involved in producing music for him and all kind of production deals and partnerships that they had. And then she had a real big uh, problem and lawsuits and stuff. And she knows all kinds of information, too, about Al Sharpton that I don't think you're going to hear anywhere else. Uh, but we're going to be bringing her on in a second. I'll be introducing her. Um, coming up in August, uh, we're going to start doing another show on Thursday nights on uh, Shake and Wake Radio, you know, with Rick and Annie, if you know those guys. And I'm going to be on their station on Thursday nights right around this time, 5, 6 o'clock. And also, too, Victoria's going to be doing a show on there. My daughter, Victoria, has her show, Teen Truth, uh, that she does every Saturday afternoon at uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon on CJ Mars Radio. And she's going to be doing a show, too, as well, over on uh, uh, Shake and Wake. Now, you can find uh, the old Opperman Report shows on the Opperman Report YouTube channel and also on Spreaker.com. And very soon on iHeartRadio. So I really need everybody to get behind us here on Spreaker.com and help support that uh, the Opera Report channel. Uh, last week, you want to check out uh, Thomas Sheridan. We did an incredible show last week about Jimmy Savile, uh, this incredible guy in the UK who turned out to be a pedophile and a necro necrophilia, you know, having raping dead bodies and, and corpses involved with serial killers. Uh, it got, the guy was the, on the top of the pops. He was the host, uh, BBC pre presenter. Big shot over there. Knew the Queen. Hangs out at Buckingham Palace. Uh, knows Thatcher. Hangs out at the, uh, whatever they call that, uh, the White House over there in, in England. <laughs> okay. Uh, but it's a great show. Check out Thomas Sheridan and Jimmy Savile uh, on the Opera Report YouTube channel. We're getting a ton of response for that. And as a matter of fact, I want to welcome everybody who, who are uh, Thomas Sheridan fans. We, we picked up a whole bunch of listeners last week, and they're, they've all been commenting on all my different videos, so I, I know that we've picked up a lot of new uh, listeners. Uh, and don't forget, uh, freedomslips.com. It's a listener-sponsored station, uh, so if you like what you hear, you got to go to freedomslips.com and click on the Donate button. I also want to thank some guys over at freedomslips.com. Uh, without mentioning any names in particular, Jerry, uh, but who who really, uh, uh, really, man, helped me out this week, man, were really, really kind to me and very supportive of, of my struggles that I'm going through in my personal life, with my personal litigation. A lot of you guys are familiar with it. And uh, a lot of the guys down at Freedom Sets so really uh, um, got together and uh, and really helped me out I mean, in, in a big way. And, and Robin and uh, Jerry and you guys and Kat, and I, I really want to thank you all. And, of course, I always want to thank my producer, uh, Ann Francis, and uh, Christoph Moses, and uh, Keith Davis. By the way, Keith Davis is going to be coming on in a couple of weeks when we have uh, the heart uh, heart attack coming on. Uh, heart Fisher, a radio host and uh, movie producer, fascinating guy. Next week we got uh, Steve Wick, uh, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, journalist uh, for Newsday. And he wrote a book about the Cotton Club murders called Bad Company. And it's all about Roy Radin and the Process Church and uh, Robert Evans and the, the murder of Roy Radin involving the, the, the around the production of the Cotton Club uh, movie uh, that starred Richard Gere. And that's a fascinating story. And, in fact, we're going to be doing a whole series of shows on that. But like I said, tonight we have Jackie Hollander. Uh, she hails from uh, Chicago. Uh, she's like a, a 
the raising horses and all kind of stuff like that, but has a real big history um, in the music business and working with James Brown. Jackie, are you there? Hi, Ed. How are you? Jackie, I'm great, man. Thank you so much for coming on tonight. I know you're really busy with the, the big premiere, this big James Brown movie. I know a lot of people are bothering you. So thank you so much for coming on. Uh, can you tell us about yourself and, and your life and your career? Well, um, I've been in the music business uh, most of my life. Um, I was married to somebody in the Atlanta rhythm section for um, 15 years, and um, I worked with everybody. I mean, there's pretty much nobody that I didn't work with. I was in country music. I was in rock music. I uh, was in shag music, beach music. I worked with the Tams. I wrote a song for them. I did a song with Billy Joe Royal um, when he had his hit, Burns Like a Rocket. I've worked with, um, oh gosh, Bertie Higgins. I worked with some of Leonard Skinner. I worked with ARS. I worked with um, some from Cameo. I've worked with a lot of people. And, of course, Mr. James Brown. So you, know, you spent most of your adult career in the music business? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. So, and, and now, wait, now, but now you're like a, you have like a farm, right, with, with horses and stuff, you were telling me? I do. I have three, uh, three horses, uh, quarter horses. Um, I bred uh, my mare and uh, artificially inseminated her, and, and I have this beautiful little, uh, little uh, male. He's a... He's a handful, I'll tell you that. And um, so I have three of them, and I also have um, my favorites are my pygmy goats. And um, my female um, goat, Miss Becky, she she kind of got pregnant on her own without me breeding her, and um, she had little three teacup baby goats. Did you force her to get married? <laughs> Uh, she had. She already had a husband, and that's Mr. Wiggles. All right, great. <laughs> and, and so I think she cheated on him. Yeah, life on the farm, huh? Okay. Yeah, all, yeah. All the scandal that goes on behind the scenes on these farms, folks. Okay, so why don't yeah. you get started? What do you want to get started with the story? Like how you met James Brown, or you know, what do you want to do? You know, um, I guess I can start off with, um, you know, I, I, it's been a very rough road um, for 29 years for me. Um, uh, in the beginning, I, I was a songwriter and a record producer, and I used my talents to, um, to raise money for those less fortunate. Um, I found out that I could do benefits, writing songs, bringing in nationally known entertainers that were all my friends, and we would do benefits, and we would raise up a lot of money for kids, sick kids, um, my country's veterans. Um, because my dad was a vet and, you know, so I come from a long history of the Navy. And, um, that was my calling, was doing for others. Now, and, where was this in Chicago? No, this was in Georgia. Georgia. And what year was and, this? Uh, um, this was through the late 70s into the 80s. Gotcha. And, um, I came up with this idea one night. I was, um, I had just finished doing a song for the Marriott Corporation, and it um, was with Billy Joe Royal, and I had done um, a grand opening for one of the largest hotels in Georgia, and it was this really the big thing, and I wrote this song, and the song was a gift to this city, my song was, from the Marriott Corporation, and um, I had gone up and I was driving around. You know how when you're young you do things and I happened to meet this um Falcon football player. Okay. And the fact <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I can hear that. <laughs> and uh, of course I was a lot younger and a lot thinner and a lot prettier, okay? And um I had met him and um he said, you know, I, I saw you on the news today. I was actually kinda of driving around to get away from the media. Actually what I was doing kinda of like now. And um, he said, uh, have you ever thought about, you know, doing something for us? And I said, well, you know, what am I going to do for the, for, the, for the Falcons and their football team? And he said, well, what a football song. And I went home that night and I thought, wow, I'm going to take the football players and I'm going to get them singing and I'm going to put the Atlanta rhythm section on it and I'm, I'm going to make it real big and it's going to go raise money for kids. And, of course, um, my first choice was Ronnie Millsap. 
because I was country. You know, I was writing country. And, and this kind of where the Falcons practice was country. Right. And um, when I started dealing with the Atlanta Falcons, uh, their choice kind of changed. <laughs> the players um, wanted a um, soul thing. And, of course, they, they, they picked Mr. James Brown. And um, I went on to search to see if Mr. Brown, um, if I could even reach him to get in touch with him. And um, I did. And, uh, Were you a James Brown we, fan? No, actually, no. Not one, not at all. Okay. <laughs> um, no, I was more um, the Beach Boys, and um, um, I love the Eagles, and uh, I was just, um, I love Frank Sinatra. Mm. And um, I'll go ahead and say it. Um, uh, now I can't even think of his name. Um, Barry Manilow. Barry Manilow. Oh, no, you almost had me there. <laughs> I was going to take yeah. that dancing for a minute, but now forget it. <laughs> okay. I loved him. I mean, I loved Barry Manilow. Okay. I really loved Barry Manilow and Abba, you know. So, no, I wasn't. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, um, he... After a bunch of wrangling, uh, he agreed to do it. He wanted to do it. Um, I met his lawyer, Buddy Dallas, who had just come on, um, taking James Brown on, and his career was pretty much, uh, he'd had some issues, and he, his career had sunk really low. And we decided that um, I had Coca-Cola. Um, I had gone and gotten Coca-Cola as a sponsor, and I had a lot of big sponsors, and it, um, this was going to help um, needy children, children with disabilities, children uh, from broken homes, um, children, you know, of abuse. And that, that was a big cause to me. And um, um, Mr. Brown was not I don't think, used to doing for people, but um, I sat him down. I said, look, this is going to be good. And... He really liked it, and we ended up doing a song, and we ended up doing a show, and it ended up becoming a standing ovation to a sold-out audience in the Fulton County Stadium. And one thing led to another, and um, he decided that we were going to become partners, and he liked the fact that I could pick these charities. Um, he liked the fact that he could give. He he liked the fact that he was learning that in life, sometimes you have to give back. You can't take it all. You know what I'm saying? Even if you're down on the rock bottom, I hear you. You, can always, you can always find in your heart, if, even if you have nothing, if you give of your time, you're giving. And sometimes when someone is deathly ill or somebody's got no family, that giving can, can just change someone's life. And so he started learning, and we worked together like dynamite. I mean, we were uh, we were very good together, and um, uh, it it excelled. Before it was all over, I decided that what we needed to do was create, because we were giving to so many charities, and in the '80s, money started flowing like champagne, and we were raising. So much money. I'm I'm talking maybe one charity eighty thousand dollars for six hours on a benefit. Now that's a lot of money. So that's the, so during that time, that's pretty much how James Brown was making a living. Huh? So then during that period, when you were, when you were running all these charities uh, and all these like benefit concerts, that's how he was making a full time living, just doing that. No, he was not. He was doing his job, you know, working. Um, I started writing for him. Um, um, we worked very well in the studio. Um, we started doing other projects. Um, we did jingles. Um, we brought money in for that. I'm not going to say everything was 100% uh, charity because, of course, we did things that made us money, too. Okay. You following me? Sure. And, um, um, and it was about 87. Um, um, we had um, really, I had decided, I said, you know, I have an idea, we'll make a trust. And um, we were sitting down with this lawyer, Mr. Dallas, um, and I said, let's, let's uh, 
Mr. Brown said, well, let's, let's call it Papa Got a Brand New Bag for Kids. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> I want to call it the I Feel Good Children's Trust. Okay. And he's like, I like that, Jackie. How about living in America for kids? And I'm like, no, 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 no. And he said, he told Mr. Dallas, he said, let, let, her, let, her, let her name it. She do all the work, let her name it. <laughs> so um, that's how it started. And um, we took, I took a very special child. She, uh, she was dying. I had taken some other kids. There was a little boy that had no arms and legs, believe it. It was horrible. Mm. Um, I had many, many, many children that we, we were starting to do. And we did this trust because... We were raising so much money, and we were giving them to these organizations. And I would, you know, we would hand them this money, and I would walk away, and something in my heart would say, how do I know? How am I sure that this money really went to what they say? How do I know they're not paying themselves a big salary? How do I know they're not buying pens and papers? You know what I'm saying? How do I know this money is not going into, like, if a veteran needs a television? How do I know they would even go buy that TV? Because normally, I would go buy the TV. You know what I'm saying? I do know what you're and, saying, yeah. Um, that's when me and Mr. Brown and Mr. Dallas sat down, and it was like, um, you know, this is the best way to go. We're going to build this trust, and, of course, he told Mr. Dallas, he said, you know, if anything happens to me, um, everything of mine will go into this trust. And, um, of course, me, I didn't have that much, but I said, everything of mine, if I die, goes into the trust, too. And at the time, Mr. Brown was not at what you call the financial level he was when he died. So, it was kind of like the three musketeers sitting down, and none of us with a lot of money, okay? But we were able to give money to those charities by raising the money. You know what I mean? And um, But if, like, if he had died at that time, I don't think it would have been a big thing because he owed so much money to the Internal Revenue Service. He had lost everything. And he was starting to uh, try to build an image back. And Buddy Dallas, just to clarify, he was actually James Brown's attorney, not your attorney. Yes. He, well, he ended up uh, during that time being my lawyer, too. Okay, but originally he was James Brown's attorney. You met him, too. He was originally James right. Brown's lawyer, yes. Now, what was it that and caused uh, – was it divorces? What caused James Brown to lose all his money and not do so well back around there? You know, I really – Back in the, I can't really answer that question. Um, I know it had a lot to do uh, probably with just uh, times changing, uh, the music changing, and going to disco. Everything changed. Gotcha. Now, did you so, just get along? Did you like him? Oh, in the beginning, yeah. He was a really great guy. Yeah, he was. I mean, he was, you know, very professional. He was... Um, a uh, very devout gentleman, a um, uh, very religious man. Um, he got blessed on everything. Hmm. And, um, you know, but about a, uh, about a year into it, um, I started um, noticing some peculiar behavior with him. Um, he was slow to answer questions correctly. Um, in the studio, he was showing some odd behavior. Um, um, he would, in the middle of a conversation, go off into something else and start rambling. And I couldn't understand him. And I started thinking maybe maybe this man, because he was in his uh, 50s, maybe this man possibly has uh, the beginnings of Alzheimer or is having um, strokes, right. strokes. PAs, whatever they want to call them. And uh, I never suspected drugs because um, I never did drugs. I, I never uh, smoked pot. I never did coke. I was. Uh, I never drank. Um, 
And here I was in the rock and roll business, but I was just one that stayed away from it. I just, I always felt like I didn't want anything controlling my mind. Now he because never I was nutty enough as it was. Yeah, I, I hear you. But he never used any drugs in front of you. <laughs> Do what? At that time, he never I'm used sorry. any drugs in front of you. No, he did not. Did, did he drink in front of you? No, no, he did not. Okay. Now, uh, what year again is this we're talking about now? What period of time? Um, it was probably about, um, I would say, late 85 going into 86. I okay. started. Um, now, now around the, that period of time, had you met Al Sharpton yet? Um, <laughs> I knew who. <laughs> you're tricky. I, I, I knew who Mr. Sharpton was um, only because I, um, Adrian Brown, um, who became my best friend, um, who was Mr. Brown's wife, um, she started talking about Revy. And, of course, um, Mr. Brown would um, talk about the Reverend. But it was a very strange thing because um, there was a lot of Reverends around these people. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you got to understand, I was in the Deep South, okay? And... um um, in the Deep South, on the Red Georgia Clay Road, there's a lot of reverends, okay? And, um, you know, so... Yeah, you, well, you'll have, you'll have some churches, too, some of somebody's churches, where not only uh, everybody as a member is a deacon. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's yeah. Deacon so-and-so, a deacon so-and-so. And by, you know, yeah. by the time you shake hands at half the church, half the church is a deacon. It, well, I mean, Mr. Brown <laughs> took me to a church during some of the roughest times and uh, when they were out to kill us all. And uh, there was, you know, they put the stuff all over the walls and, you know, the windows so that nobody could see in. And um, we sat down and there was like probably, um, I'd say, 10 to 12 men sitting there. And uh, Mr. Brown looked up and said, this is Reverend so-and-so, this is Reverend so-and-so, Reverend so-and-so, Reverend so-and-so. And I thought, my word, I've never seen as many reverends in my life, you know, but I, I was there. And, um, but, yes, the answer to your question is uh, the Revy was called Revy. So really? he, um, um, I started learning about him, yes. But but he was would he travel down to Georgia? Did you meet him in person or no? He was coming in a lot. Um, the peculiar thing about him was is that <laughs> he'd come in and Mr. Brown always had to have a lot of money for him. A lot of money always went into Mr. Reverend's hands, uh, Reverend Sharpton's hands when he would come. Um, Adrian. Um, would mention it a lot that, and of course, Mr. Brown um, would say, well, the, the, the Reverend Sharpton's coming down, and of course, his, his hand's going to be out for the money. Right. So, I mean, you know, there's got to be some money. Call Mr. Dallas. There's got to be some money for Mr. Now, Sharpton. Now, was this because the good Reverend Sharpton was uh, a promote, it was selling tickets for him or doing some kind of promotion? Because I know over the years he's been involved in ticket sales and different concert promotions as well. Our good friend, uh, Reverend Al, <laughs> that was, is this the kind of uh, business activities he was involved in with the uh, Mr. Brown? You know, I'm going to tell you something because this gets real murky. Okay. I didn't, I didn't, I, you know, I there was a lot of little uh, businesses going on that Mr. Sharpton was involved in that that I knew about that were not what I would call reputable businesses. Um, and um, of course, you look up and. You know, so I, I always kind of to myself um, kind of questioned um, what this man's real business was. Well, give me and an idea. What kind, of business, back and, what kind of business huh? did you know about? Well, he he had some Christian magazines and he, you know, um, he had some other business going, publishing and stuff like that. And he was always, you know, uh, putting this stuff out for radio and all this other stuff and um, um, it's just he would come in and um, he always had that uh, briefcase and right. of course now I know uh, that that briefcase had to do with um, 
his new title, Reverend Rat. Yeah. I mean, just just so, a, a little background, a little bit uh, in the interest of uh, disclosure. Uh, when I, I grew up in New York City, and I was a, a radical uh, activist, you know, I used to protest for, for you know, uh, civil rights uh, and all that kind of stuff back around the 70s, late 70s, and very early 80s. Uh, so I had run into Reverend Al, you know, many times when he had that uh, his Action Network. Uh, I think first it was called a like the Youth Action Network, and then the C yeah. Action. Yeah, there was always an Action Network involved, and so. You know, I had met Reverend Al, and uh, I found him to be a very uh, sincere guy back in the early 80s when I had first met him. Of course, I was a young guy, and he was a, considered my senior. He already had a big organization going on, so I had to show him respect. And uh, our activities were mostly organizing demonstrations and stuff like that through the Black Vets with Social Justice and Reverend Daughtry's organizations and stuff like that. Um, but as the years went on, I had run into Al Sharpton other times. Uh, when I, I, cause I owned a nightclub myself city and a lot of those guys you hear about where he's walking around with that briefcase with the wiretaps were the guys who came into my club and were shaking down my club. It's the same people, same group of people. And then I also knew him through different circumstances cause I'm a private investigator. And back then I was working as a private investigator and we were doing different things like, uh, uh, uh counter surveillance and finding wiretaps and sweeping for bugs and things like that. And, uh, so we, we uh, brushed against, uh, again against the, uh, these different groups and stuff like that. So um, I've had my different experiences with, with Al Sharpton as well. And so and I'm not surprised by anything I hear about those uh, accusations or allegations about the, all the different allegations you hear. When he's wearing the cowboy hat and he's doing the Coke deal, when you hear about the ticket scalping, uh, I'm not surprised by anything. <laughs> okay. Well, the, co- the cocaine, yeah. and this is real interesting because um, James Brown didn't do cocaine. Okay. Um, and But... Um, all of a sudden, there was um, the new thing coming in down there, which I was a, a Georgia redneck. I knew about Jack Daniels, and I knew about pot, and I knew about beer, and, you know, the redneck style of life. And all of a sudden, um, there was the starting to become the erratic behavior with James Brown. And let me explain to you, when I say erratic behavior, this went beyond what the human mind can 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 even fathom um and his uh my friend adrian brown became uh very dark and their behavior became um so erratic um it was did, did adrian become uh involved with the, the drugs as well yes yes okay and um there was a lot of um all night long phone calls and guns, uh, guns, many guns started coming into play. And all of a sudden, um, Mr. Brown, a lot of people think that this man just walks on the street. No, he didn't. He always had a security detail. He always had people around him. Um, but all of a sudden, the presence of weapons were around him. And um, I was young, and I thought, you know, wow, you know, you know, when you go to concerts, we used to carry security guards. They, they used to carry guns, and um, maybe this is normal, you know, because I've seen other entertainers carrying guns. It wasn't a, a shock to me, you yeah. know what I'm saying? And um, so I wasn't really afraid of him in that sense, but his behavior, I um, thought, was getting a little weird. And um, I took him um, because of Mr. Dallas and, of course, um, New York, um, we, t- we took him to the hospital. Um, I took him numerous times to the hospital. I took Adrian to the hospital numerous times. Um, Adrian was actually committed against her will. Um, and, of course, uh, there was the suspicion of drugs and then the major arrest and him going crazy. And it seemed like every day he was getting arrested. Adrian Brown was flying to New York, and of course she was going to see the Revy, and she got busted up in New York. Then she got busted getting back on the plane to come back to Augusta. The second she stepped off, she was busted in Georgia, and it was like every other day. Well, okay, what was I mean, she getting was, busted with? Uh, she was getting busted with um, PCP, um, uh, pot, um, you know that kind of stuff. Large and amounts, small amounts. Brown. Was it large amounts or small amounts? 
um, it, it was a pretty good bit, you know. Um, and um, where was this reverend? Here I, I mean, you know, she's sitting down there telling me all about this reverend, and here's, you know, and I'm thinking to myself, where is this man? And then, you know, of course, she'd be on the phone with him, and I'd hear the conversation, and James Brown would have many conversations with him and Michael Jackson, and um, he would always put the speaker on so I could listen to everything that was being said. I always felt very bad because I really didn't feel like I needed to be hearing all this stuff, but I heard it. Okay. And, you know what? Let's, let's stop right there. I'm going to have to read some commercials. Okay. Okay. If you want to take a little break and get a drink or something, it's going to take me uh, about two or three minutes. Uh, okay. But when we get back, we'll get into all this stuff about I, – I didn't know you, know you listened to Michael Jackson's conversations. So I'm going to ask you about that when we get back. Okay. okay. But first of all, I want okay. to welcome a brand new sponsor to the Opperman Report. Um, these, these guys are brand new, and it, it's kind of – I just got the ad copy uh, shortly before going on the air. And So – it's a little hard to describe, okay, because uh, it's a small group of women. They're villagers in Mexico, a group of village women in Mexico, and they live in a small town in Mexico in the mountainous state of Guerrera, okay? Now, these women have loved ones in the United States living and working as immigrants, and uh, this situation is very common, and according to official numbers of the state government, in this town of Guerrera, in this mountainous region, out of 3 million people that live there, 800,000 are currently living in the United States. Uh, so many of the people from this small village uh, migrate to the United States, some legally, some illegally, uh, all different uh, ways. So these women have family members, their husbands, their sons, all cross the border and are living and working in the United States, uh, some illegally and some legally. What they have done to support this small village, these women have come together and they've written a book of their letters to their husbands, their sons, their grandfathers, their brothers who have come to America to work. And it's called New World Women. Okay, and you could find this uh, book on Lulu.com. Okay, and uh, it's all about their, their love letters to their husbands and their sons. And it's very touching stuff. Now, these women, they're also their artists, and what they do is they create jewelry down there. And, they, and in this book, they also teach you how to make the jewelry. Now, you can go to their website. It's called handcrafted-ethnic-jewelry.com. But if you Google New World Mexican Women, you'll come up with that link, the handcraftedethnicjewelry.com website. And they have a, 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 a webinar that you can sign up for this webinar, webinar and you can learn how to make this Mexican jewelry. These women, it's a village of women artists down there. They're trying to support their village by this book uh, called uh, uh, New World Mexican Women uh, and their love letters to their family and their husbands in the United States. And also their handcrafted ethnic jewelry dot com, uh, which teaches you how to make the jewelry that they make and support themselves with. These are all women. They're artists down there. Uh, they're very concerned about the issues about immigration uh, here in the United States. I'm going to be working on this ad copy for this, this new sponsor because I really want to support this women and, the, and this, this village here in Mexico. You know, most uh, uh, radio shows and TV shows, you tune in, and they have a, 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 an advertisement you, where you want to support a village down in, in a foreign country. But here we have a village in a foreign country actually supporting the show. Okay, they're sponsoring us. And it really should be the other way around. I really wanted to uh, gather up support for them and help build that up. I got a link to their book and their 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 blog and their website on the Opperman Report blog. Okay, that's our newest sponsor. Now, don't forget our oldest sponsor uh, is Pacific West Bamboo. Amanda at Pacific West Bamboo, and you can reach her at 503-839-8126. Her email is demroots at com. Her Facebook is Pacific West Bamboo. She's got a lot of projects going on, a lot of really, really big stuff. She's going to be working on a big concert tour where she's going to be building stages and stuff. Uh, she, I'm not allowed to announce it yet, so I'm kind of giving you inside information here. Uh, but it's big, big news. Uh, rock and roll royalty she's involved with here. And uh, it's going to be a big story when it comes out. Pacific West Bamboo, your number one source for timber construction and craft-grade bamboo poles, plants, and products. They specialize in eco-friendly, reclaimed wood products for the home and the garden. They're located in Portland, Oregon, and they've been servicing the Northwest for over 10 years. They can be reached at 503-839-8126. 
That's 503-839-8126. They can and do ship nationwide. If you have any kind of construction project, you're building a new deck, you need flooring, you, whatever you're doing, or you, you want to build a backyard or something, uh, or even a stage for a rock concert, contact Amanda at Pacific West Bamboo and consult with her and see what she can do for you. Okay, you can also support the Opperman Report with a PayPal donation, Report at Gmail. Dot com. You can also hear your ad read here live Friday night and then replay it all week long on about 12 different stations twice a night. It's a great value if you want to advertise for your business. I'll make jokes about it and I'll, I'll introduce you on the show and you can help sponsor the show and get really good information. I know you don't hear stuff like this about James Brown. There's a big movie out with a big budget and a big ad campaign, but you're hearing the truth, the real people behind the scenes. Check out. InfinityHomePlans.com. That's right, Mike Gray at InfinityHomePlans.com. Check out Infinity Home Plans and Design Services, your source for 3D and 2D architectural services. They offer a multitude of products, including stock home plans, 2D digital and drawing sets, and 3D models and renderings, and more. Uh, don't forget my daughter's radio show this Saturday, tomorrow, Teen Truth. On cjmarsradio.com at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Hey, guess who's going to be on there? Me. She's interviewing me tomorrow. Uh, cjmarsradio.com at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, look for us on Facebook and stuff like that. I'll put up the link. I'll be in the chat room. Uh, we talk about all kinds of interesting stuff. It's a really good show. Emailrevealer.com. Emailrevealer.com. Uh, are you being cyberstalked? If you're being cyberstalked, all you have to do is contact emailrevealer.com, give them the email address or the website or the screen name of the person stalking you, and they can locate and identify that stalker. And they can even help uh, put together a little case for you and create exhibits that you can use as evidence in court. Emailrevealer.com. Tonight, we are with Jackie Hollander. And when we left off, it took a little longer to read the ad than it normally does, Jack, because I'm trying to explain. No, but I'm going to be hiring you for email, but I'm stalker. Oh, <laughs> let's do it. First we stalk you, then you hire us, and we catch the stalker. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I bet you got a lot of stalkers. I wouldn't be surprised because I know uh, I have. Yeah, fanatical fans, especially Michael Jackson yes. fans. Or, or, or I've, I've exposed him a lot. But what do you know about Michael Jackson? Now, you listen to private conversations uh, between – Mr. James Brown and Michael Jackson. Tell us about that. You know, um, there was concern back in the early 80s with Michael and uh, the younger youth. Um, James Brown actually had a conversation when I was sitting in his office with Michael Jackson about it. What year? Um, and, um, in the early 80s. He right. was saying. That was before, huh? before Jordy Chandler came out. That was before it even was released even before an allegation even came. Right. Um, James Brown was uh, concerned with him and said to him, you need to stay away from all these children as close and as you're getting. And um, Michael said, well, you know, I, I love the kids. And James Brown said, well, I'm working with the kids now too, but you've got to keep your distance because if you don't um, – you're gonna, uh, you're gonna have some problems. And of course, he was right. He was so right. Do you think James Brown suspected no good, or you think uh, he was overlooking it, or what do you no, think? No, I think James Brown um, was a very. James Brown was a highly intelligent man, and of course, James Brown knew the secrets um, behind the smoked glass. All right. And being beside him, I started learning the secrets um, behind the smoke glass. And that's when it gets really scary in this business. Yeah, because uh, even uh, Al Sharpton, again, he, he promoted that Thriller tour uh, with that mafia guy, uh, Francais, uh, one of the Francais brothers, uh, who uh, actually one of these brothers testified against his own father uh, in, a, in the RICO federal uh Mafia trials back in New York City, and uh, he was one of the producers of, of this tour with uh, Al Sharpton. And I personally know people that had allegations of child molestation at that tour. That and this was way before this Jordy Chandler story first uh, came out, which was years later, uh -huh. '93. So I had heard about these stories yes. again, just like you. Okay, boy, I, I think we might know some of the same people. What do you think? I think we do. Yeah, um, I think it's a very small world. <laughs> I definitely um, agree with that, yeah. And 
And um, at that time, that's when um, the arrest became really bad, and um, Adrian started reaching out uh, when James Brown was going to jail to Reverend Al Sharpton. Well, before, and, you get, okay, before you get to that, describe that big incident where he had the shotgun and he was uh, hijacking cars and stuff, and he beat up some woman. There was a big incident, right, with a chase and everything? Well, that all started, um, basically, he started uh, carrying the guns around, and of course, he went into the insurance seminar, and unlike the movie uh, depicts in which I saw, that he fired the gun off in inside the insurance seminar. He did not. He did not fire off the gun. But a woman did uh, suffer a massive heart attack because of it, because of being under that much fear. Right. When he went in there. And, of course, they didn't show all that. She's a lovely lady. I did get to meet her in the years later. Um, and the fear that it left her with was PTSD and, of course, many physical ailments. What, what, sparked, what sparked him to, to go into an insurance seminar with a shotgun? Um, the insurance seminar was connected to his office. Okay. The office buildings. And he thought they had come in and used his bathroom. His oh bathroom God. was... His bathroom was inside his office. Right. It was nobody used that bathroom. It was like the king's throne. Okay. And uh, I saw that bathroom many times. And he went. He was high on PCP, and he went crazy. And it ended up in a two-state high-speed chase. Right. Bullets being shot at him, and uh, it was insane. And, of course, uh, he was beating Adrian. He knocked her teeth out four separate times. She was a very, very, very battered woman. He shot at her. He shot holes through the uh, rooms. I know because I saw them. Now, with all these um, incidents, but, would the police show up and just, you know, let him go? What, what would happen? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. He was arrested, but he always got out. Now, here's what's very interesting. Wait, wait, wait. He got out and they dropped the charges or, and they covered it up, or, or he got out and he had to go to court? He got out and there were minimal charges. Okay. Um, this was a convicted felon. He already had a felony rap. He should never have even been allowed to have guns. Yeah. But because he was the godfather of soul, and, and that name matched him perfectly, he was the godfather, and he was the godfather of the, the black world. I mean, James Brown was with the Black Panthers. He was, he was a, a worldwide uh, godfather. This was not just a name that was given to him. It was he earned this name. He was the godfather. People trembled when they saw him. I was with him. You would go in places and people would tremble mm. be because of his power, his connections. Um, and eventually um, it got to a point as his partner um, uh, in, his, uh, in his problems that Mr. Brown was facing many, many years in prison for assaulting and beating up Adrian, for um, shooting at police. Um, James Brown was facing possibly a life sentence. And that's when Mr. Brown decided his partner, me, um, was going to host this huge benefit. For him. And I, yes, and I am, um, it ended up costing, um, besides doing the benefit with all the money going to the police, and before it was all over, I had a nationwide police boycott against me. And the judge, I never did anything. And the judge basically said, if you fail at this, you're going to be right beside him in prison. And I'm thinking, this just can't be happening. Wait, they this said if you, put on a benefit, if, you, if you put yeah. on a benefit, yeah. you would be going to prison? And, huh? They, they, they would charge you. Not just that, I had to report to a police 
detective every day, every single thing I was doing. There were po- my hotel rooms got broken into. It became a worldwide nightmare. And it, I get woke up uh, Thanksgiving morning, and it's a reporter, and they said, do you realize that you have uh, the Fraternal Order of Police uh, in a nationwide boycott against you? And, and the Fraternal Order of Police were the ones that were going to receive all the money from the concert. Right. But they were angry that the judge had said, okay. I'm going to let give you a slap on the hand. You can do a concert. Well, the bad thing was is James Brown didn't put it together. He was supposed to, but he didn't. It fell on me. James Brown left the country, and I took on the feat of putting together this huge concert. Now, this is what's very interesting. Where was Reverend Al Sharpton? Good question. He's the promoter. He's the son of James Brown, as he told the world. I've got a freaking police boycott against me and James Brown, and where's his son? Well, yeah, I'm going to tell you that? where his what son was. was. This was 88. Okay, I'm gonna yeah, ask, yeah tell- Sharpton was in – he was in pretty good power in those days. He had a, he had a nice uh, street team that, that was – I'm going to tell you where yeah. he was, okay? Yeah. He was up there doing his Tawana Brawley tape. Okay, that's what I thought. Now he comes down and he gets. He comes down and he gets. Sits down with James Brown and listen. I heard these conversations. Okay. Okay. And he wanted James Brown to come up there and get in the Tawana Brawley mess. But you know what? James Brown looked at him, and he said, "I don't believe it. I'm not getting involved in it." Something stinks here. And Reverend Al Sharpton was on a, he was on a spiral to take down Stephen Thedonis. Right. A massive spiral. Well, I'm going to give you a little, a little insight today. Okay? Okay. This has never been released to the world. And I'm going to release it on your show. All right, let's do it. Stephen Pagonis was my friend. Okay, really? You knew Stephen Pagonis before this? Stephen Pagonis and I have been friends for years. Okay. And um, this was probably one of the most, uh, during um, 1988, while um, Mr. Brown was going insane and Mr. Sharpton was coming in and out, the day that I got brutally taken to the woods, April 1st, 1988, um, was the day that they were indicting them up there in New York for the Tawana Brawley case. Well, that's when uh, – indicting? That, you mean that's when Al Sharpton was being sued? No, that is in 1988 when they were indicting, trying to indict – Stephen Pagonis for the rape of Tawana Brawley. Right. And Al Sharpton was trying to get an indictment. And I was taken to the woods and brutally raped and tortured. Okay. And and uh, on the day that I got raped, Al Sharpton had met James Brown at the Green Jacket earlier that day. The, the Green and, Jacket in Georgia? In Augusta, Georgia, yes. Okay. Um, James Brown had planned the meeting for 5 o'clock, um, 4 o'clock, something like that, and he had met with Al Sharpton earlier that day. Um, when I walked out of the office with James Brown and Buddy Dallas, we were there on the trust uh, negotiating, um, finalizing everything on the trust, the I Feel Good Trust, and, of course, um, James Brown, I put my tapes and everything that I had carried, my songs that he had listened to that day. He was totally coherent when he was in the meeting with me and Buddy Dallas. He did become a little um, irate. It was uh, not on drugs. He was not on drugs. He, um, He got mad at Buddy Dallas because during this, he said in front of me, 
when we were talking about if he died, what he wanted when he died. And he said, I want everything to go into the I Feel Good Trust. Everything. And Mr. Dallas interjected as a lawyer and said, but Mr. Brown, as your lawyer, I have to advise you that you do have children. This is the first time I'd ever seen James Brown show any, um, like, just outward um, mania. He um, he became um, like a praying mantis. He jumped over the desk. Um, I was sitting in a chair, and he came over the desk, and he went at Buddy Dallas, and he went at his throat. And Buddy was sitting on a couch. Oh, I will never forget it. And uh, he went at Buddy like he was going to choke him, and Buddy's face was really red. And he said, Mr. Dallas, don't you ever tell me what to do with my money. I am not giving one penny to those kids because I've given them an education. I have brought them up, and I will be damned if they're going to use me as a stepping stone into the future. The sheer fact that they are the children of James Brown, they have been highly educated, is enough for them. He was adamant. Yes. Was Buddy, Ed, like, yeah, I'm here. Was Buddy like a physically big guy, you know, that he could fight with Brown? Or was he like an no. old man? Oh, know? gosh. No, no. James Brown was a very, um, a very, um, very, I guess you would say, physically strong man. He was um, a boxer. He um, he had very, very strong arms. He was, in, um, he was very, and of course, I saw the side of him through the rape, and of course, I will never be the same. I suffered from PTSD and Stockholm Syndrome, and um, I'll never be the same after that night. And, and uh, do, do you feel like um, that, that you can... Uh, Explain to us and describe to us about the attack. I'll try to do the best I can. Okay, we, um, we have about four minutes before the big break. I was telling you about that nice long break. So now, from what I'm understanding, you had this meeting. James Brown started yes. to attack his attorney. Then James Brown went to meet Al Sharpton at a hotel or something. No, he had met he had met um, Al Sharpton prior to coming into the meeting with us. He had been with Al Sharpton that whole day. Gotcha. And then he came in to meet us on the um, I Feel Good Trust. Okay. And we were basically, Buddy had a yellow notepad. I'll never forget it. I mean, I, I will never forget this because I still have the piece of paper where James Brown said, this is the name I want to call her, and he wrote it down on the piece of paper. And um, he was talking about um, the children, his his own children, and uh, that's when Buddy interjected, I mean, James Brown interjected to Buddy. And Buddy's face was so red. I'll, ne I'll never forget it. I mean, the fear in his face. And I was just taken back. And that's when Mr. Brown um, turned around and looked at me and he said, go get me Brunswick stew and get you some too. And he said, go to the little shack, the Brunswick stew shack um, down the road. And picked me up some uh, Brunswick stew, and he looked at Mr. Dallas, and he said, do you want some? And Mr. Dallas was like, uh, no, no, thank you. And I think this was the first time Buddy Dallas had ever seen his client in that manner. Right. But I will say this. He was not at that time, to my knowledge, and I don't think to Buddy's knowledge, high on anything. I think it was just a, disp a display of anyone telling him what to do with his money. James Brown knew every penny he had. You could not try to mess him over or steal money from him because that was, he knew everything. Yes. Well, we got the break coming up. This is that nice long break I was telling you about. So just uh, take a little break and uh, we'll come back after this. We're with Jackie okay. Hollander, uh, who uh, worked uh, with, was partners with James Brown. Uh, she has all kind of information about uh, Al Sharpton and Michael Jackson. Who knows what else? Uh, she has a horrific story we're going to be getting into about how she was uh, brutally attacked. And uh, 
Maybe we'll discuss it. Maybe we won't. It's up to her. Uh, but it's part of her big lawsuits that she has going on and stuff like that. So we'll be back after this break. Uh, don't forget, it's freedomslips.com. Uh, if you want to support this station, you go to freedomslips.com. You click on the donate button. Uh, this is the Opperman Report, uh, Revolution Radio. And we'll be back right after this with Jackie Hollander and the real James Brown story. Welcome back. Welcome back to the Opperman Report. Every Friday night, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, listener-sponsored radio. If you like what you hear, uh, visit freedomslips.com and click on the Donate button. We are simulcast on CJ Mars Radio and 365 Live. And tonight, uh, and also to we we start out on shoutcast.com. During the week, awakeradio.us, hazyradio.com, firehorse radio, and uh, shake and wake radio on Thursday nights coming up. Uh, find the Opperman Report YouTube channel uh, and listen to our old shows, our new shows, all that kind of stuff. Tonight we have Jackie Hollander. And uh, Jackie, uh, you there? Yes. Okay, Jackie, I know we're getting to a tough part of the story, you know. And I really want to thank you for coming on the show and uh, and really uh, bearing your soul. I know it's a tough week for you because with the opening of the um, the, the, the movie and stuff, I'm sure it's bringing up a lot of memories. Um, oh, gosh. I can imagine, okay? and yeah. uh I'm here with you. Um, what can you tell us about what happened with the, the attack? Um, well, we, we, I came back with the uh, Brunswick stew, and uh, we finished up our meeting, and um, I'll, I'll never forget it. Uh, Mr. Brown asked me um, if I wanted to ride with him to see a Volkswagen Rabbit he was having redone for his and um, I've since later learned that that was Yama Brown. For years, I kept telling the story of the Volkswagen Rabbit, and nobody would confirm to me um, who it was, but, of course, um, his son did. And I think it's important that I, before I get into that, okay. and I know we only have an hour left, and I think it's very important for your listeners to know I am 100% the partner of the I Feel Good Trust. It has been in litigation for eight long years. Not one penny has gone to one needy child. Um, hundreds of millions of dollars were designated for the poor and needy. Um, it was um, hijacked basically from the time he died. Buddy Dallas was removed as a trustee and accused of wrongdoing um, without any hearing or anything. They have kept me out of court. Um, we have gone to Chicago, of course, dismissed for wrong jurisdiction. Los Angeles, of course, dismissed for wrong jurisdiction. Uh, South Carolina, which is so corrupt, keeps keeping me out. We are in the appellate court in South Carolina right now as we speak. Um, there is a wonderful reporter who has diligently um, attacked them and gone for Freedom of Information Acts because they have lied to the IRS. They have um, falsified paperwork. They have refused to let anybody see how much money is in the trust. This is all uh, uh, involving a trust fund for the poor and needy children. Let me ask a question. Um, Wait, who, who, who came in uh, and snatched up the trust, and how were they able to do this? Well, I'll tell you how it started. Um, and I know that this is going to sound very peculiar. Otherwise, I am his victim, but I am also his partner in this trust. Okay. And um, I should have standing, and I should be allowed to see that this trust be uh, done the way it was supposed to have been done. And uh, James Brown was murdered. He did not die of a heart attack. Um, he died of a lethal overdose of drugs in the hospital. What he kind did of drugs? He did not die of pneumonia, like they said. Um, it was covered up. He was the only, and, and this is very, very interesting. Here he is, this worldwide known um, black man, okay, they refused to do an autopsy on him. The doctor wanted the autopsy done. 
because he was fine and he was fixing to be released from the hospital. And at 10 o'clock, he was seen by his physician. I have talked and spent several hours on the phone with his physician. And he was scheduled to be released. Now, here's what is so interesting. During the time that he died for my rape, it had taken me years, uh, if you know anything about post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I had passed federal polygraph tests. I have passed, I've had so many polygraph tests that I'm like the polygraph um, guinea pig. Let, let, me, let me ask okay? you a couple of questions because we're getting a lot of different places. You're an investigator. Everybody's, everybody's uh, you know, invest, um, you know polygraphs. Sure. And I've sat down on there a lot of them. Well, let me ask you this first. Now, you, you were attacked in the woods and raped. Now, now who, who did that? James Brown. James Brown attacked you and raped you. Now, so after that, uh, did you go to the police? Um, I was driven back to my city. I was not uh, living in the area where I was attacked in South Carolina. And, of course, I went to the hospital because I was, um, I was badly, badly hurt. Right. And um, um, Mr. Brown, and that's part of what happened prior to my rape, um, we did go to the Lincoln dealership to look for the um, Volkswagen Rabbit, and then he went to a Texaco, and he asked me to um, to get him some um, of those Jolly Ranchers. Okay. And I'll never forget it. I, I got out, and I went in, and I got the Jolly Ranchers, and I got the, um, the Coca-Colas that he wanted, and I brought them back, and I got into the van, and I, I'll, I'll never forget. He took bag, and he started screaming at me, and he said, you didn't bring me 100. You didn't bring me 100, and I started just crying. And I, um, because I was always this person that tried to, tried to be perfect. I, I knew I had gotten the Jolly Ranchers that he had asked for, I mean, I, he didn't ask me. He never said, I want 100 Jolly Ranchers, or I would have counted them, but I didn't. And I um, brought them, and when he got them, when I went back, the, um, the lady at the Texaco, she said, oh, the eccentric Mr. Brown, because she saw me crying. And she said, come on, I'm going to help you count out. 100 Jolly Ranchers for him. Right. And when I got back to the van and handed him the bag, he never even looked or counted them. He, he didn't even look at them. Oh, okay. he was crazy. Okay, so we don't, we don't need to go into. I don't. I don't want to be in a situation where you're you're actually reliving every moment of this. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, this tragedy. Okay. But now, just uh, suffice to say, the attack takes place, right? And you, you, you get away somehow, right? No, I, um, he, um, he drove deep, deep down into the woods, and, um, he said that, um, first he was driving down the expressway. He was, he must have, he asked for a cigarette, and I gave him one of mine, and he puffed on it, and he threw it out the window, and he said it was too strong. Mm. And then he told me to that his wife had some cool cigarettes in the back, and he asked me to reach behind his seat and get him and give him one of those. And I did. And all of a sudden, it wasn't probably um, 30 seconds to a minute after he started smoking one, the sides of his face started twitching. Right. Um, like, I'd never seen a face do that before. It looked like muscle spasms. And he started, um, his head started going to the left and to the right. And he started saying, look at, look at the trees. Look at the trees. The trees are bending. Look at the trees. Look at the wind. And he started speeding up. He was going like about 100 miles an hour. And I started thinking, oh, my God, he's having a stroke. He's like um, having a major stroke. 
because my dad, when he was in the VA, he did that. You know, he um, when he had his stroke, he 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 went like that. And but, you, but now I, we know it was probably PCP. There was probably PCP it was, on the it was yeah, it on the was, cigarettes. It yeah. was well, actually, it was formaldehyde. Right. He he smoked formaldehyde um, and PCP together, and um, it was laced in the cigarettes. Right. And um, and of course he um. He veered off down the road, and he um, he went into this little sandy area, and it, it was all trees, all these trees, and he was just hitting trees. He was telling me the trees were like rubber. They would bend, but they wouldn't bend. Right. He was just crashing the van into the woods, and um, and once he got way deep down into the woods, um, um, he... Um, had his hands on the wheel and he had on these black gloves uh, without fingertips in them and um, he said to me get in the back of the van and he called me by um, my name and I, I was um, I was scared I was very scared I wasn't scared when he was going on the freeway that he would hurt me that wasn't um, he had the shotgun wedged between the seat and the um, center part of the van, you know, the um, place where you put your drinks and stuff. I, I wasn't scared then. Okay. I, I, I had thought maybe he was going to crash and that if I jumped, but I also thought at that time that if I jumped, it would kill me because he was going 100 miles an hour. And, um, of course, then when he got in the woods, he, um, he, 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 he took the shotgun and he he came between the seats, and um, of course, for hours, he was like an insane human being with foam coming out of his mouth, and um, he brutally, uh, he, he wasn't even a human being. This was not the man that I knew. This was not James Brown. This was not the person I had known. This was 100% pure devil and and crazy person and animal and everything together and um i wanted to die i i i wanted to die and i remember um thinking to myself this will be a lot easier if he goes ahead and shoots me and i thought about my mom and i thought about my twin who had um um disabilities and I um asked God to please please um please bring me home because I didn't want my mom and my family knowing that I had been found in the woods dead. And God God gave me that wish and he brought me home but I didn't ask him for an easy road and he hasn't given me one. And I um I fought James Brown all the way to the United States Supreme Court, and um, my writ was accepted into the United States Supreme Court um, two weeks before he died, and um, on Christmas Day, and um, I changed the law for all rape victims. There is no longer a um, seven-year or uh, uh, statute for limitations. On rape victims, it's um, it can be 30 years whenever they get the courage to come through the door, as long as they can prove what they're saying. And so I I can live with that. Yeah, that's it's HB. It's HB 1462, Jackie's Law. Okay, well then that's thank God for that, you know. Yeah, yeah, and um, um, I was fighting him um when he died and um that's when i um got a call uh through my case we were in the supreme court that um in the middle of night christmas and of course now every christmas it's uh, a flashback to the night james brown died yeah. and um um every april fool's day is a flashback to this and every uh Halloween is a flashback to uh, the high-speed chases and the insanity of, of, of life with James Brown. And um, 
there's a lot of flashbacks that never go away because when you're dealing with a worldwide icon, every day their music is on the radio. Right. Every day there's something in the paper. <laughs> they really can't get well. And, so, of course, right now I'm in court fighting for the I Feel Good Trust. Okay, a couple of questions which, now. After the attack, did you ever see him again in person? Yeah, actually I did. Um, I... Um, I was ordered to um, do that concert, so I had to go through with it. Oh my God! Okay. By the by the by the uh, judge, and right. I had been working on that that whole year, and um, it was so bad that I suffered a Bell's palsy stroke. And, Wait a second! Uh, what did Gallic. he say? What did his wife say? Did they say anything to you? Um, Adrian, Adrian knew it. Adrian knew it, and um, I went to Buddy Dallas, and. Um, of course, uh, it was it was a horrible time, and yeah. through doing the concert, um, it wasn't. Uh, it was a, it was very tough. He, um, I think, in his mind, I think he was so out of it that I don't think he could remember everything in detail. You know what I'm saying? I think he was so crazy. Yeah, because, sure. If he's seeing the trees bending and stuff like that, he's not going to have total recall of, of his uh, episode. Exactly. But, right. he, uh, everything was perfect with him. Okay. You know, everything was fine uh, the next day. It was, there was no, um, right. you know what I'm saying? And uh, But when I did put it in front of his face later, um, you know, um, he had told me that night that if I told anybody that, you know, there would be riots and they would kill my family, and uh, as all attackers tell their victims that. And of course, with James Brown, he was so powerful, and I was very young, and I was very naive, and this was a person that I idolized. This was a person that I respected. This, um, I was in a horrible situation. There had been no William Kennedy Smith rape cases. There was no DNA back then. There was no uh, um, hard copy. There was no uh, uh, rape uh, sinners like there are today. Um, I was in a horrible situation, and I was also white with long blonde hair and blue eyes, and he was a black man during the civil rights issues. Right. Where white women did not uh, walk with a black man. So I had already kind of put myself in a very bad situation, um, but I had black friends and I had white friends, and um, I do to this day, and I've never believed that you should live your life in discrimination of another human being, whatever color they are. I don't care if they're purple, Chinese, or who they are. Uh, they're human beings. So I, I don't go around looking at people like that. I, I just, if you're kind and you have God in your heart, then you're a good person. Now, with the trust... I'm not saying I don't support the Iraqis or anything. Please don't get me wrong, Okay. For the, all those people, please. Okay, okay there. <laughs> well, but the thing is, now, with the trust, were you a yes. trustee in the trust? I was. We, me, uh, James Brown and I appointed Buddy Dallas uh, that day to be our trustee. So there was one um, trustee. And, yeah, Buddy Dallas. See, because normally how they do that with a trust is all members of the trust are trustees, and then when one dies off, the other two gained control of the trust. Right. James Brown and I had um, full control with Buddy Dallas. Um, we did it like the three musketeers. Everything we did, we did together. Right. So it was me, James Brown, and Buddy Dallas. We had worked on many, many projects together, and it was us three together. Um, we didn't expect uh, – uh, Buddy Dallas would have never taken a penny from James Brown – Buddy Dallas spent years giving James Brown money when he didn't have two cents to his name. Right. Um, I but, but, can remember. But, but, uh, what I'm uh, trying to get at, though, is how you lost control of the trust. We lost control, and I'm going to tell you. Okay. Uh, James Brown had a meeting. Um, I had him in federal court, and okay. there were arbitrators going on here in Chicago, and there were meetings set up with arbitrators and me and James Brown about. November of um, of 2000 and, um, 2005, and um, uh, I'm sorry, 2006. This was right before he died, and he held a meeting at his house, and he told his daughters and all of his children 
he brought everybody there and he said, here's where it's at. Nobody's getting anything. When I die, all of my money is going into the I Feel Good Trust. Okay. Everything I own, my copyrights, everything. Now, here's what's very interesting. His two daughters, Yama and Deanna, and, of course, you'll see them out there bragging about how much they love their daddy right now. They were suing him for RICO and organized crime. Um, they were actually suing this man for millions right before he died for RICO, organized crime, racketeering, the whole bit. How many people sue their fathers for RICO and organized crime? It's pretty heavy, isn't it? Yeah. And... Um, they were forcing him into settling because they said that he had stolen their songs that they wrote when they were two and three years old. I'm a songwriter, and I can honestly tell you, I don't think I ever wrote a song when I was two or three. And if I did, I sure don't recall it. Let me ask you a question. And I, who, okay. who or what has control over all of James Brown's money right now? Right now, the state stepped in. Okay, because he had no will. How, how it stepped in was, yes, there is a will, but the judge decided he didn't want to go along with the will. So he was going to change the will. And he removed Buddy Dallas and um, moved the other two trustees that James Brown had added on in the year 2000. And then the daughters, how this all started was, the minute their father died and they demanded no to autopsy on their father, and if you can remember, Mr. Reverend Al Sharpton, his right-hand man, was with James Brown when he died, immediately they told the doctors no autopsy. Now, wait, I'm getting a and, question from my producer, Ann. She's asking me, but um, how come it was a really long time before they buried his body? What I'm going to get into that. This okay, is, sorry. She's, she's good. She's good. I love okay, her, yeah, She's ahead of me. Um, they literally took the body, refused for an autopsy, had the body hidden all around. Nobody knew where it was, but he Dallas didn't know, and this is his client. The daughter took it? Yes, and they didn't want anybody to get near the body because an autopsy would have showed how he died and how much lethal uh, drugs were in his body. Now, they're out telling the world he died of pneumonia, and died of a heart attack, but th that really wasn't it. He didn't die of pneumonia, and he didn't die of a heart attack. What does the, and, what does the, uh, the coroner's report say? Well, that's where it gets a little murky, okay? Um, I think they just put on their heart attack or pneumonia, okay? okay. But the doctor told me um, that he had just checked him, he was fixing to release him, um, that he knew something was very, very... Um, wrong with some of the people that were there with him and uh it, he left the room and of course mr bobbitt's story is he went to go get a bottle of insure at 12 20 at night in the crawford long hospital um but if you have a, a patient in the hospital with a heart attack the nurses monitor everything and the pharmacy was closed so where did he go to get this bottle of insure and why, at 12.20 at night, did he decide that he needed to go get this bottle of, of Insure, okay? So, to make a long story short, um, they took the body, and uh, they kept the body out for a long length of time, and he had designated where he wanted to be buried. He wanted to be buried. He had showed me um, next to his father and next to Adrian Brown, who also died of suspicious circumstances, his wife, 10 years earlier, and in the hospital with a lethal overdose of drugs, which was also said to be a heart attack. And I worked on that diligently because she was my friend, and I knew she had been murdered. And, of course, it was during the O.J. Simpson case, so it was covered up. Mm. So you get into... Mr. Brown dying here, and they decide to take him on tour. Um, Reverend Sharpton took him up to the Apollo, and they were taking him all around in different outfits. And the dead body. I mean, it was, yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is that not crazy? And they're holding all this stuff and carrying on. And, of course, Michael Jackson comes to the funeral, and everybody came to the funeral, and they finally did have it, which went on forever before they finally did. CNN ran round the clock news. And, um, you know, uh, they were very closed mouth on everything. And the daughters immediately, the minute their father died, filed when they realized that their daddy had told them the truth, that they weren't going to get anything, they filed papers against Buddy Dallas and against the for the courts. that They wanted them removed because we had coerced Mr. Brown with a gun, basically, to leave all his money to the poor and needy. And this is what started the huge snowball that, you know, happened, and the judge, they hired all these big-time lawyers, and they made everybody out to be, oh, this was a criminal thing to, um, they forced our daddy, they forced him to give up multi-millions to the poor and needy, it's what he wanted to do, it's what he'd want, I got video footage of this man talking. Did these daughters wind up, did they wind up with any money? (laughs) This gets really good, okay, this gets really good. On the day of the funeral, one of the daughters, Dr. Yama Brown, she's a pharmacist, her husband steps out into the public and goes on Channel 46 and gives an interview and says, there is not a bone in my body that believes that my father-in-law died of of a heart attack. My father-in-law was murdered. On the day of the funeral, his wife stabs him. Are you ready for this? She stabs him on the day of the funeral. Who stabs their husband on the day of the funeral of their father? Unless he's threatening to blow the lid. Is this the way? Is there any of this in the movie? What? No, none of this is in the movie. <laughs> this is the movie. None of yeah. this. <laughs> the rape's not in the movie. Yeah. None of this is in the movie. I mean, everything's been kept like... Uh, South Carolina has kept the lid on this like a a pressure cooker. You know why? Why? Because they don't want the public having, they don't want hundreds of millions going out to the poor and needy. They're sitting down there with the Bokai Club under a judge, and he's put in a court-appointed, um, executor. A court appointed, it, it, well, not executor, but a, like Plus a eight. TPA over the money, right? Okay, okay. But here's what's good about it, okay? This is the third one he's appointed because the other were found to rip off the trust. They held, they held that huge fire sale up at Christie's, sold off his stuff, and the trustee kept all the money herself, never even turned it over to the trust. That's how bad this has gotten. So one reporter has gone for the FY, you know, the four-year reports, right? All the secrets that the attorney general does not feel belongs to the public. The That the attorney general feels, okay, well, we can keep this quiet, and we've got hundreds of millions of dollars, but and it's a children's charity, but we're not going to let the public know where the money is, and we're not going to let them know how much money it is, and we're not going to let them know anything. And in down there, it's so corrupt that they throw your lawyer out of court. I mean, the judge just sits there. They don't want me in court because I have 17 crates of evidence to prove 100% the truth that this man I have him speaking, his mouth moving, his eyes blinking, talking about the I Feel Good Trust and how he wants everything to go. And this dates all the way back to 1985. Okay, one second. Now, now wait, the daughters okay. didn't get – the daughters started this off. They started the ball rolling. They have not yeah. gotten any money out of this, right? Well, they're doing pretty good. One made $180,000 on the premiere the other night in Augusta when she sold tickets for it. Still peanuts, and brought though. it down yeah, there. Peanuts huh? comparing to the value of this trust, that's still peanuts. Well, okay, you know, let's look at what they've done, okay? So now they've got somebody controlling 
controlling, and this thing was fought all the way to the South Carolina Supreme Court. And guess what the Supreme Court said last year? To the Attorney General and to the daughters and to all these people that have done this, okay? Their ruling was, you ripped off the poor and needy. You pirated this trust. You violated your job as an Attorney General. You have violated the rights of the poor and needy, and you all are out of here. You're all out of this. This should, this case needs to start over again with the truth. Do you know that was a year ago, and that judge is still down there holding court with the very same people, the daughters, and they're debating DNAs, and they're doing this and doing that, and they're not even obeying the United States Supreme Court. Yeah, I'm Is not that, that su- not crazy. No, I'm not that surprised. This stuff happens. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I get calls like this all the time. People, you know, like yourself, that are involved in multi-million-dollar trusts that they got screwed out of the money, and, and no one knows what's going on. And this one's doing this, and this, and and it's and there's trustees and there's executors, and they're all got their hands in their pockets, and and, and uh, lawyers. Okay, it's six thirty-five. Now, uh, one thing we can do is, if you're if you're feeling yes. fresh and you want to go on, we can go on past and do an after show and take some phone calls, and we can. It's a lot more casual too. Uh, it it okay. may broadcast live, or it definitely be up on uh, the internet and stuff like that. And you you want to keep going? Yeah. Okay, great. Let's keep going for door number three. <laughs> okay, I knew you would. <laughs> Everybody, <laughs> wants, you know, I don't tell anybody beforehand because otherwise, say, oh, what three hours? I'll never do three hours for you. Yeah. But uh, thank God. Okay, we're going to be taking phone calls. The number to call in at, after this break, I'm going to read some commercials too, is 702-605, I think it's 4894. And we'll call in with some questions for Jackie Hollander, uh, the victim of James Brown, the friend of James Brown, the partner of James Brown. Uh, still probably has some love for James Brown. I think she forgives him, man. You know, this is really... I so, did forgive him. Yeah, I can tell. I can tell. 702 605 Four eight nine four. Let me read some commercials. Take a little break there and get a glass of water. I can't thank you enough, man. You're doing great tonight. Thank you very much. It took years. It took years to forgive. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. I'm still doing the things I can't forgive myself right now. But real quick, let me read some commercials, and then we'll uh, we'll continue with this amazing story with Jackie Hollander, a partner of uh, James Brown, uh, a confidant and insider with uh, Michael Jackson and uh, Al Sharpton. And all kinds of other stuff, too. I can only imagine. We'll get into more questions about that kind of stuff. Pacific West Bamboo, 503-839-8126. Everybody knows Amanda over Pacific West Bamboo. Uh, Little known fact that Amanda was there on Gilligan's Island when they needed to build those huts. And then all those huts were built by Pacific West Bamboo, your number one source for timber construction, craft-grade bamboo poles, plants, and products. If you have a craft, you want to make a little fountain, you want to do a project at school, contact Pacific West Bamboo. Uh, and uh, you're going to hear all about uh, their great products. they got a Facebook page called Pacific West Bamboo, uh, just as similar to the, um, the name of the company, Pacific West Bamboo. 503-839-8126. They can and do ship nationwide. You'll be sitting at home. The mailman knocks on your door. we got some bamboo for you. Anybody here to take it? And they bring in the bamboo. You do whatever you want with it. Okay. InfinityHomePlans.com. This is Mike Gray, my buddy over at InfinityHomePlans.com. Check out Infinity Home Plans and Design Services, your resource for 3D, 2D uh, draftsman services. They offer a multitude of products, including stock home plans, 2D digital drawing sets, 3D models and renderings, and more. If you're doing any kind of a project where you think you need designs or you need home plans, Contact Mike Gray. Tell Mike Gray I sent you. Mike Gray is a great guy. He's a huge supporter of this show. And I want you to promise me that if you have any kind of project you're working on uh, that, that requires draft services or requires this, these kind of services in these areas, infinityhomeplans.com. Get a hold of Mike Gray. My daughter, Victoria, has a show debuting tomorrow. Uh, not debuting, but uh, on tomorrow, like the fifth or sixth show on Teen Truth, cjmarsradio.com, 1 p.m. And I'm her guest. And we're going to be talking about some struggles that we're going through right now. Speaking of which, if you want to Google uh, on GoFundMe.com, it's called uh, 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 Help Save My Family by Ed Opperman on GoFundMe.com. We're looking for your help uh, to help me out with the, my litigation. 
in court here with my kid and my ex-wife and all kind of stuff we have. It's a crisis situation. We need your help. Uh, please uh, uh, lend us your support. Uh, help save my family by Ed Opperman on GoFundMe.com. Okay, check it out. We need your help, guys. Um, EmailRevealer.com, your home of the online infidelity investigation. Do you think your boyfriend's cheating on you? You think your husband's cheating on you? Did you know that 30% of the people using online dating websites are either married and they're cheating on their spouse? Give us their email address, and we're going to trace it back to online dating websites, uh, to social networks, to fetish sites, to swinger sites, cam sites, porn sites, uh, even gambling sites. We can trace these emails back and produce a report that you can use in court if you're involved in a custody litigation. Uh, you can also support the Opperman Report by going to oppermanreportgmail.com and giving us a PayPal donation. Our new sponsor, These Women in Mexico, the website is handcrafted-ethnic-jewelry.com, okay? And it's uh, you can Google New World Mexican Women. Uh, they have a book. Uh, they have a book that they've written down there that are real-life letters and uh, uh, communications with their loved ones here in America. Uh, this is a village of women in Mexico, in the mountains down there, in Guerrero, in Mexico. And most of the men of this town have left. They've come to the United States. These women are looking uh, uh, to, to support this village. They create jewelry. They want to teach you how to make that jewelry. You go to handcraftedethnicjewelry.com. Uh, they also have a, another website. Uh, it's called uh, revolucionmexicana.mx. And I checked that out, and it's a blog they created to support the book and to support the website. And all this kind of activity they're doing down there. they got this book, New World Women, uh, How to Make Your Own Traditional Mexican Jewelry. Okay, and this is real authentic uh, creative women down there in Mexico with this book. You go to lulu.com. You can pick up the book. There's a link on my blog, The Opperman Report. And we'll be talking about this a little bit more. They're, they're a brand new sponsor, and I really want, to, want you to get to know them. Uh, so check out uh, Google New World Mexican Women. Their book's only 19 bucks, by the way, and it, and, and it would really be a big deal to support this little village down there of these women uh, that are, are, you know, their husbands and their fathers and their sons are off in America trying to support this little town. Um, so um, we'll be talking about that more during the after show that Jackie was so kind. So Jackie is still there with us? Yes. And, you know, I want to say something so I don't forget this because you're an investigator, okay? Sure. So I was telling you about the husband that she stabs, right? Right. Okay. Get this. It wasn't even days later, okay, days later, the man goes to pick up his kids because, you know, they filed for divorce after he tried, she tried to kill him, and they're in court. Right. Get this. He takes the kids back to her. She calls him to take them for ice cream. He takes them back. He drives home, gets out of his car, and he's riddled with bullets and drives himself to the hospital and dies. Well, do you think it, it might have been like an accident, like he was cleaning his gun? <laughs> no, no, no. A person <laughs> riddled him. Oh, okay. <laughs> they said there was enough blood in the car, too. It was like the sea of, uh, it was like uh, what St. Valentine's Day, the Valentine Massacre. Perhaps just, he was driving they, by the shooting range, and he was wearing a, a, a T-shirt with a target on it, and it was an accident? No, he got out of his car, <laughs> and okay. someone scaled a high-security fence and just blew him away. Were there any charges in that case? Uh, there's, uh, there's still an investigation going into that death. Okay, and how many years ago has that been? It's been quite some time, right? Right after James Brown died. When he said that, okay. when he said that he knew his father-in-law did not die the way they told the world. Now it would seem to me, okay, that if it's the state that's stealing this money, right? Now here they got this kind of stabbing and this kind of murder and stuff like that. Wouldn't they jump all over this daughter and and bury her under the jail with all kinds of yeah? Th- uh, yeah. You would think so, but yeah. uh, Reverend Al Sharpton's down there helping her, okay? <laughs> so and this is really funny. Here's Reverend Al Sharpton telling the world how much he loves uh, the children and he wants to do what's right for people, but you haven't heard a word out of him in this. He's not fighting because, guess what, James Brown didn't even leave him a peanut. No. After the funeral, he went in to find out how much money was left for him. And they said, I'm sorry, Reverend, he didn't leave you anything. Because James Brown was very angry at Reverend Al Sharpton. Oh, really? Toward the end there? How come? 
Well, I'm not going to get into that, but that, I assure you, is going to come out later. Okay. No Maybe hints? on your show. Okay, let's see. Let's see. Okay, let's see. I'm not here. Tonight. I'm here when you need me, okay? <laughs> I value my life. I value I, my life. <laughs> I hear you. You know, a lot of people uh, look at Al Sharpton as this kind of uh, like a, a race uh, profiteer, uh, sort of like as a leftist or a liberal or whatever. But most people don't realize that his campaign for president was sponsored and funded by a right-wing uh, political dirty tricksters group that has roots back to uh, the Watergate. And, and, and the, um, the Village Voice did a great a series of articles on that campaign. He, he was brought in to split the Democratic vote and put Bush into office. So if anybody's that is a, correct. Yeah, and if anybody's a right-wing conservative, man, Al Sharpton is your guy. He's your buddy. He, he's working for you. Okay, so, and then you, you may not realize it, but this guy's been bought and paid for a long time ago, man. Oh, yes. He is 100% bought. Yeah. So now let's see. Now, you know what? You, you were involved with Al Sharpton. You were involved with Michael Jackson. Anybody else? Like, what about, like, Muhammad Ali or someone like that? Or No, but the van that I was in that day it was done by Muhammad Ali for Mr. Brown. It had gold tires and all this other stuff on it. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Brown told me that Muhammad Ali had had that specially done for him. Well, that's interesting. Because yeah, they, they had a connection, too, right? Yes. Uh, Don King. um, of course, we all know now Reverend Rat was after Don King. Well, let's get into Don King now. Because now, if, if Don King was involved in this, you, you'd think he would have got his hands on some of this money, right? Um, You know, that's another part of the story. Um, But all of this money is sitting down there now, and it's being controlled by a little Gestapo down there. And to this day, nine years later, they haven't given a penny and um, it's going to be very interesting. Um, they're setting up all kind of LLCs, and they're moving money around, and they're paying um, close to 150 and 200 thousand dollars because the daughter buried Mr. Brown in her front yard. So he's over by the barbecue grill and uh, in a mausoleum. And you're not even supposed to bury dead people on your property, but she didn't want to do what her father said because they changed the will. And she makes uh, about 200000 a year just to mow the grass around the mausoleum from the poor and needy's fund. Okay, see, she is getting a cut. She's getting oh, yeah. a cut. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, so she's, is, okay. She's getting so a cut. It's, it's peanuts, but she's getting something. And this is the one that they did. Oh, no, she, she's getting more than that. She okay. get, she, they're setting up LLCs, and, um, and this is the poor and needy's money, and – the state does not feel that anybody, even this wonderful reporter out of Newberry, who has filed for your request to the point that it it uh, it's all in court now. They've gone after her, um, Sue Summers. Uh, they've gone after her, and um, the judge ruled that the state just about two weeks ago has to show the four-year reports, show the 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 financial documents. That she's requested. Yeah, it's, and, it's very unusual. Um, for, yeah, for those kind of documents, especially if this is a charitable trust. Uh, exactly. This, yeah. Well, guess what happened? The judge orders them to show it, and now they're in court in front of the judge, fighting that and telling the judge that they don't want to pay what the judge is saying. They're still not gonna. There's like a diary that had evidence in it to prove that somebody wasn't uh, this Tommy Ray wasn't his wife. And the DNA, the child, is not really James Brown's, and the judge refuses to allow that to be evidence. He's put gag orders on everybody. I mean, this is a mess. And there, um, the lawyers that are representing the daughters down there are all, uh, and it's like a circle of them. And I'm on the outside of that circle because I'm not politically correct because None of them have any evidence on this trust, and I have all the evidence. And me and Buddy are fighting tooth and nail for the truth to come out. Yeah, now, now Buddy's a lawyer, right? He, is he still practicing law? Yes, he is. So now he must un- see what's going on with the politics in this. And, 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 and oh, with- yeah. I mean, he tried to hire uh, huge law firms to right. represent him, but, of course, it is so corrupt. Uh, a lot of lawyers don't even want to um, be in it because they know that they'll never practice again. 
that um, when you go up against the, the attorney general and the uh, AG's office and everything like that, no. I mean, you, the DA, and I mean, it's just, it's all the way down to um, their paid. Let's see, one thing I did find out was they were paid um, paid a law firm to represent the person um, that oversees it right now, the court-appointed attorney. They have paid millions of dollars to this law firm to fight people like me. Yeah. Now, now, and this is out of the poor and needy's money. Now, I have to say, okay, maybe you don't like me, boys, okay? Maybe you don't like me at all because I have the truth. But when you're residing over a trust that involves a charitable trust for the poor and needy, you're supposed to hear all sides, and you're not supposed to be biased because you want what's right for them. But unfortunately, my evidence will make the money go to the poor and needy. So but you, they you want to know want what, Jackie, you, you know, uh, to say poor and needy, these people don't care about the poor no, and needy. No, they don't. You know, they, they see a big chunk of money, right? one penny. But what's no, happening now? this movie out. It's, it's eight years later. See, now, once they've stolen the money now, right, everyone looks at it in the court system, all these lawyers and these judges. They look at that not as the poor and needy's money. They look at that, hey, that's the stolen money, and how do we get our hands on the stolen money? They don't look at it as poor and needy money. They're, they're, they're gone, they're, that's a, a memory, you know, that one time this money was destined, destined for poor and needy. Now it's well, the, now they put this James Brown movie out. Okay, and right. Supposedly, some of that money is supposed to go – into some of these LLCs that they're uh, that they've built, and they're going to start downloading. And of course, I own all the I own quite a bit of the masters on James Brown. And you know, I'm waiting for these people to come attack me. You know, I mean, I outright own them. I have my releases and everything. If I wanted to tomorrow morning, I could start pumping out never before released uh, albums on James Brown. How come you don't? You know, uh, the headache right now of the movie and um, some of my stuff is going up for auction um, starting um, down in Texas. Uh, I am going to be placing some stuff up for auction uh, okay. because I have a lot of memorabilia of James Brown. And um, I'm trying to do what I can do to try to make some things right. Because there's been a lot of, in nine years, um, I've seen total destruction of human beings' lives. Yeah. Um, Buddy Dallas was almost killed in a horrible accident. Um, a Mack truck just came out of nowhere and hit him, and he basically broke his neck uh, two years ago and has been badly, um, badly um, injured from that. And he struggled a really um, hard battle. Now, real quick did. question, because then they made this movie. They had to pay some money to the estate uh, for the rights to do this movie, correct? Uh, yeah, quite a few millions. And and how was who was it paid to? It was it paid to the trust? Uh, yeah, Mick Jagger did all of this with um, with um, I think his name's Tate Taylor and Brian uh, Glacier from um, Imagine and. You wonder why that money is not going. And they did their premiere in New York, and this was a real uh, jaw slapper. Guess uh, guess where the money went to from that premiere? Al Sharpton? No, it, oh, but he was there. Yeah. He was there with Nick. Where'd it uh, go? It went to the Humane Society. Really? Yeah. For what reason? Because uh, that's what they wanted. Um. I guess the poor and needy kids, I, you know, and, and let me tell you something, I rescue animals. Yeah, I know, yeah, that's a fine show. And, I, and I, I, I believe 100% in, in, in all of our animals, and that's another thing I could get into is the euthanasia of animals and stuff at, at these shelters. So I am 100% pro saving the animals, but the poor and needy children also are um, very, this is, they're the ones that have been cut out of all this money. And they're the ones that were his wishes and his will. 
and if you follow his will, everything tells exactly. There's no uh, nothing in the will. It's just his wishes were laid out 100% the way he wanted it, and they don't want to follow the will. The daughters want to say that he was coerced into making the decision to give his money to the poor and needy. Okay, we're, we're about to drop the big station of, of Revolution Radio Freedom Slips dot com in about three minutes. So, and then we'll we'll continue after uh, the after show, which will be recorded and put up on a podcast. Uh, but do you have anything you want to leave our audience with? Uh, some final words in like two or three minutes. You don't have a book. You're, you're not selling a book. You're not selling a website. No, I'm not yeah. selling a book. I, I really, you know, I've, every day is living a book, but I have not sat down and uh, written a book. Books kind of, um, this would be bigger than Five Gone with the Winds and all these pictures and stuff. I, I'm trying to maybe do a documentary and release to the to the world the truth. I saw the movie last night. It it, <laughs> it was very sad and it was very pathetic and and it did not tell any truth. Um, probably Mick Jagger felt like he was going to be sued because James Brown hated Mick Jagger. Um, it just, it, it, you know, the truth is hidden. It's buried under a, uh, a black cloud. And it's, uh, the public needs to start asking questions. Yeah, we got to get into They're this. really paying thing. attention. Yeah, but like how Mick Jagger got involved. Did, did these two have a relationship? No, they, uh, uh, James Brown hated him. He called him the son of the devil. And uh, if you read the Globe this week, um, it has James Bra- uh, James Garner on the cover. Um, my story's in there about how much, um, and James Brown's son, about how he was murdered and, and how um, he hated Mick Jagger. James Brown's so son was murdered. No, uh, James Brown's son was talking about how his father is murdered and... Um, they need to exhume the body. Okay, great. I'm not hold, the only one out there saying got, Okay, hold on now. Okay, we just had Jackie Hollander. Uh, we're going to continue with the after show. If you want to give us a call, 702-605-4894, or you can Skype me on ed.hopperman. Next week, we got Steve Wick. It's a huge story about the, the Cotton Club murders with Robert Evans and Lainey Jacobs and uh, Roy Radin, who was involved with the Process Church and the Son of Sam murders and all kind of stuff like that. And Tiny Tim is involved in the story. All kinds of guys. I'm even going to ask, uh, after the we, we drop uh, Revolution Radio, I'm going to ask uh, if uh, uh, James Brown ever had any connections to Roy Radin. Because it seems like he would have been involved in those Royal shows. Okay, uh, Revolution Radio, goodbye. We'll see you next week. If you want to support the station, go to freedomsips.com and click on the...